Peace, family. I'm back with another one. This is from the YouTube channel, Sonoye Wahe. I had a brother's link in the description. This is going to be over the We Are the American Indians, episode four, the Yamasi War of 1715. If you like the content, hit that subscribe button. If you're a returning viewer, I appreciate you, as I always say. So without holding y'all, we're going to jump straight into it. Peace and love, family. On behalf of Akuno Sankofa Bay, you know what I'm saying? Jay, where you at? I'm trying to help our people elevate. Hope. H O P E. We giving them hope. Giving them hope. We doing what we gotta do, you know. Shoot Every day, one day. step at a time, man. We gonna make it happen. Helping our people out the way. Sometimes I practice focus thought and meditate. I'm trying to come with other ways to help our people elevate and seeking knowledge make me levitate. The lifted mental state is what results from how we orchestrate. This for the family's sake. Let's self reflect and self evaluate. And every day, make sure the steps you take you calculate. Receive a master's fate. I know I can't exist without the hate, but that's okay. I balance that with higher self today. Success is on its way, and after that, my flesh can pass away. Monsieur, Ale, Didani Lasti, Tawaton, Sonoi, Wahia. Hello and welcome. My name is Sonoi Wahia, or in English, Nightwolf. I would like to take a moment to express my heartfelt thanks to Will, Linda Robinson, Loretta Rajan, Lonnie Richardson, L. Student, Nanyan Waller, Big Reg, Kundi Mai, and Joanne Scousbo. Or for your support for my channel, your support is greatly appreciated. Welcome to We Are the American Indian, Episode 4, The Yamasee War of 1715. Today, we embark on a journey through the pages of history to explore a chapter often overlooked in the annals of American history, the remarkable and often turbulent conflicts involving the Gullah, Yamasee, Creek, Seminole, and Muscogee indigenous peoples. These struggles, shaped by a tapestry of cultures, alliances, and a profound connection to their ancestral lands, have left an indelible mark on the southeastern United States. In this video, we'll dive deep into the stories of resilience, resistance, and the fight to preserve their heritage. Notably, we'll uncover how the Yamasee played a pivotal role in ending slavery, contributing to a seismic shift in the course of American history. From the early encounters with European settlers to the epic battles of survival during the tumultuous 19th century, Century, this narrative unfolds with lessons and legacies that resonate even today. So, join us as we uncover the forgotten pages of history, paying homage to the strength and spirit of our indigenous ancestors, and gaining a deeper understanding of their enduring impact on the American story. But before we embark, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to stay updated with our historical explorations. Now, let's step back in time and journey through the untold stories of the Gullah, Yamasee, Creek, Seminole, and Muscogee Wars. Let's dive in. Well, yes, before actually the Creek word came into existence, which was created, there was Muskukali or Muskogi, as you may have heard. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that was Wali. Um, my particular tribe was Yamasi. Mm -hmm. Yamasi was considered and is considered in the Industrial Commission, uh, which is a congressional set, as being described factually as. Uh, for lack of a better word, African or Negro. Mm -hmm. uh, we were one of the only tribes that were labeled that way, but were a part of the Muscogee Confederacy. Mm -hmm. um, history has proven, though, that we had a very large empire ourselves, being the only tribe that had upper and lower Yamasi. And within that, a lot of tribes you might have heard were a part of that confederation called Muscogee, which was actually Yamasi, mm -hmm. um, which is the Hichiti, the uh, Apalachee, the Oconee, the Sokehachi, those different tribes, the Hupspa, all those were different villages and tribes under, quote, the Muscogee bloodline, but were actually Yamasi people and citizens or tribal members. The Yamasee War of 1715 holds a crucial place in history when examining the impact of slavery in the United States. Their story serves as a poignant reminder of the profound connection between indigenous peoples and the institution of slavery, shedding light on a lesser known aspect of America's complex past Understanding the significance of the Yamasee in the context of slavery is essential for a more comprehensive exploration of the historical, social, and cultural forces that have shaped the nation. 
this introduction sets the stage for an in-depth examination of their role in the complex tapestry of American history and the enduring legacy they left behind in the struggle against slavery. The Yamasee, Gullah, Creek, Seminole, and Muscogee communities share a common heritage, with Creek being a relatively recent designation as they all belong to the broader Yamasee group. Additionally, the Yamasee played a significant role in numerous conflicts and battles across southeastern North America. We will mention a few of the prominent wars and disputes involving these indigenous tribes. The Yamasee War of 1715 to 1717. The Yamasee War was a conflict between British settlers and several indigenous tribes, including the Yamasee, Creek, and others in the southeastern United States. The Creek, who were also Yamasee, had multiple conflicts. The First Creek War from 1813 to 1814. This was part of the larger conflict known as the War of 1812, and it involved the United States fighting against a faction of the Creek Nation. The Second Creek War from 1836 to 1837. This conflict occurred during the broader Indian removal period, and it was a result of the Creek Nation's resistance to removal from their ancestral lands. The Seminoles, who were part of the Yamasee community, engaged in numerous conflicts and battles. The First Seminole War from 1817 to 1818. The United States initiated this conflict to try to seize Seminole lands in Florida. The Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. This was a prolonged and costly conflict between the United States and the Seminole Nation in Florida, mainly resulting from the Seminole resistance to removal. The Third Seminole War from 1855 to 1858. This was the final attempt to remove the remaining Seminole people from Florida. The Muscogee also fought many wars, the Creek War of 1813 to 1814. This is often referred to as the First Creek War and was part of the larger War of 1812. It involved the Creek Nation and the United States. The Second Creek War from 1836 to 1837. This conflict is often seen as an extension of the Creek resistance to removal during the broader Indian removal era. The Third Creek War from 1855 to 1858. This conflict involved the Creek Nation and the United States and resulted from tensions over land. These wars and conflicts were complex, with varying motivations, alliances, and outcomes. They were a part of the broader historical context of indigenous dispossession and removal from our ancestral lands, which profoundly affected but not limited to the Yamasee, Gullah, Creek, Seminole, and Muscogee peoples. Some factors that contributed to the Yamasee War were land disputes and encroachment. The British colonies in the southeastern region of North America were expanding rapidly, which often meant taking over land traditionally inhabited by American Indian tribes, including the Yamasee. This led to conflicts over territory and resources. Unfair trade practices. British colonists engaged in exploitative trade practices, offering low value goods in exchange for valuable furs, deerskins, and other products from American Indian communities. The American Indians felt cheated and economically disadvantaged. Also, the constant breaking of promises and treaties. The British made promises to the American Indians in various treaties, including assurances of protection and respect for their lands. However, these promises were often not honored, eroding trust between the parties. In addition, the slavery and mistreatment of American Indians. Many American Indians were enslaved or subjected to harsh labor conditions by the British colonists. This led to resentment and further strained relations. There were also outbreaks of hostilities. The Yamasee War began in 1715 when the Yamasee, along with other American Indian tribes such as the Creek, attacked British settlements in the South Carolina region. The initial attacks were swift and took the British colonists by surprise. The conflict involved a series of battles and skirmishes, including the Battle of Poco Taligo and the Battle of Salkehatchee. These engagements were marked by varying degrees of violence and bloodshed. The Indian forces used guerrilla warfare tactics, ambushing British forces and employing hit-and-run strategies. The British sought the assistance of neighboring American Indian tribes and allied with them to suppress the Yamasee and Creek forces. This alliance played a crucial role in the eventual outcome of the conflict. Now, we are going to take a look at the book, The Yamasee War, 1715-1717, South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology, University of South Carolina. The Yamasee settled on the South Carolina coast in 1683 following their flight from the Spanish coastal Georgia Gual missions. The newly arrived Yamasee first settled on the islands around Port Royal Sound including St. Helena, Paris, and Hilton Head Islands. In 1686, the Spaniards attacked and destroyed both the Yamasee towns and Stewart's town, a nearby settlement of Scots. 
the Yamasee relocated their settlements closer to Charlestown on the banks of the Ashapu and Kambahi rivers. They returned to the area around Port Royal Sound in the 1690s. A 1707 act established the Yamasee lands on the mainland in the upper part of Port Royal. Within this Yamasee territory, the Yamasee were settled in two distinct clusters. The upper Yamasee towns, Poco Taligo, Poco Sabo, Huspa, Tametli, and Chalafina, were occupied primarily by Gual who had been part of the Spanish mission system on the Georgia coast. The lower Yamasee towns included Altama, Akuti or Okuti, Ikasi or Chechasi, and the Yuha. These lower towns were formerly residents of interior Georgia the Spanish province of Latama who had sought refuge among the Gual missions following devastating slave raids by the Westo. Many of the Yamasee towns have been excavated by archaeologists. Now, I will briefly explain. The Yamasee War of 1715 to 1717 was a conflict involving the Yamasee and American Indian tribe and British colonists in South Carolina. The Yamasee had originally settled on the South Carolina coast in 1683 after fleeing Spanish coastal Georgia Guau missions. They initially inhabited islands around Port Royal Sound but were attacked by the Spaniards in 1686, prompting them to relocate their settlements closer to Charlestown on the Ashapu and Kamahi rivers. In the 1690s, they returned to the Port Royal Sound area and in 1707, Yamasee lands were established on the mainland. The Yamasee territory consisted of two distinct clusters of towns. The upper Yamasee towns were primarily occupied by Gual people who had been part of the Spanish mission system on the Georgia coast. The lower Yamasee towns included people who were formerly residents of interior Georgia within the Spanish province of Laitama. They sought refuge among the Gual missions after devastating slave raids by the Westo. Many of these Yamasee towns have been excavated by archaeologists, providing valuable insights into their history and the events leading up to the Yamasee War. To continue, the Yamasee War included a small number of what might be called major military engagements, and these were confined to the first three months of the war. Afterward, hostilities were limited to Yamasee and Muscogean raids on trading caravans and frontier skirmishes with South Carolina militia that continued sporadically for the next two years. Peace with the last of the hostile groups, the Lower Creeks, officially ended the war in 1717. While rare, the major battles described below were nevertheless significant, for they included hundreds of combatants on each side and were fought on two separate fronts north and south of Charleston. Furthermore, these battles were like microcosms of the colonial landscape, defining relationships among the period's three major cultural groups, Europeans, Native Americans, and enslaved Africans. Indeed, historical accounts of these battles are clear that almost half of Carolina militia forces was comprised of enslaved Africans. Poco Taligo and Yamasee raids on Port Royal, April 15, 1715 at daybreak on this day, a colonial delegation from Charleston was brutally tortured and murdered by Yamasees at the town of Poco Taligo near modern-day Beaufort, SC. The scene is described in chilling detail by Charles Rod, a Charleston merchant, in a 1715 letter to his employers in London, Rod 1928, describing the attack and torture of Indian agent Thomas Nairn writes, But next morning at dawn their terrible war whoop was heard and a great multitude was seen whose faces and several other parts of their bodies were painted with red and black streaks, resembling devils come out of hell. They threw themselves first upon the agents and on Mr. Wright, seized their houses and effects, fired on everybody without distinction, and put to death, with torture, in the most cruel manner in the world, those who escaped the fire of their weapons. I do not know if Mr. Wright was burnt piecemeal or not, but it is said that the criminals loaded Mr. Nairn with a great number of pieces of wood, to which they set fire and burnt him in this manner so that he suffered horrible torture during several days before he was allowed to die. Rod goes on to describe the harrowing escape of families from their plantations around nearby Port Royal as the Yamasees began their war. Now, to explain, the passage describes the Yamasee War, a conflict that took place in the early 18th century in the southeastern part of what is now the United States. The war involved several major military engagements, which occurred in the first three months of the conflict, and later, hostilities shifted to raids, skirmishes, and sporadic battles. Here's a breakdown of some key points in this passage. 1. The Yamasee War was a significant conflict involving multiple groups, including Europeans, American Indians, and they say enslaved Africans, but this is incorrect, and we will disprove this claim later on. Moreover, it began with major battles and eventually transitioned into raids and skirmishes. 2. The passage notes that the major battles in the Yamasee War involved hundreds of combatants on each side and were fought on two fronts, north and south of Charleston. These battles were important because they defined the relationships among the three major cultural groups in the region. 3. The composition of Carolina militia. Interestingly, the passage mentions that almost half of the Carolina militia forces were comprised of enslaved peoples. This highlights the complex dynamics of the time, with enslaved individuals forced to participate in the conflict. 
for the Poco, Taligo, and Yamasee raids on Port Royal. The passage provides a specific incident that occurred on April 15, 1715 at Poco, Taligo, near modern-day Beaufort, SC. In this incident, a colonial delegation from Charleston was brutally tortured and murdered by the Yamasees. We have to point out that the Yamasee were not in the wrong, as this was their land that was being stolen by European invaders. While their actions may have been flawed, it's important to acknowledge that many of these injustices and atrocities and worse, which they had experienced, were inflicted upon them by Europeans who had no rightful claim to the land, such as the raping of their women and children and killings of their families simply because the Europeans wanted their land. 5. Charles Rudd's account. The passage references Charles Rod, a Charleston merchant who wrote a letter in 1715 describing the attack and torture. Rod's account provides a first-hand perspective on the events that occurred during the conflict. 6. Escapes from plantations. The passage also mentions the harrowing escape of families from their plantations around nearby Port Royal as the Yamasees began their war. This highlights the disruption and fear that the war caused in the region. The Yamasee War was a complex and violent conflict that involved various groups and had a significant impact on the landscape of the southeastern United States during the early 18th century. Uh, citation I've seen about the Yamasee people, uh, and you have to excuse my ignorance, mm -hmm. is there was a Yamasee War yes. that took place. Is that the same? Were your people involved in that? Yes, my people were involved in that. You're okay. talking about the Yamasee War of 1715 right? Uh, and what happened in that transpiring aspect of it. Uh, or historical facts was that we had been working and dealing with the Spaniards for quite some time. We actually interacted with a lot of the colonists that came here, the French, the Scots, mm -hmm. the uh, Spaniards, and the British colonies, or co colonials. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened basically was that there was a miscommunication and unfair trading practices which led up to the war of Yamasee, or the Yamasee War of 1715. Mm -hmm. But what history does not also say, it wasn't not just the unfair trading practices, but it was also the um, raping of our women, mm -hmm. the, the taking advantage of the children, the killing of men uh, that also sparked this. And we had a prior war to that, which was the war with the Tuscaroras, um, that we assisted the Tuscarora for the same type of situation. So that's what led up to the War of Yamasee, uh, the War of 1715. Mm -hmm. uh, contradictive to what history is teaching, we continued to fight. Though it never stopped. It is the continuation that you hear of in history with the Seminoles. Mm -hmm. The word Seminole, which is uh, being deprived as runaway, was in reference to, in our historical uh, documents, as running away from that war that continued on with the Yamasi, which started firstly with the Yamasi. So that's where the term Seminole comes from. Also, through history, they talk about a lot of black Seminoles. Well, the mm -hmm. black Seminoles they were talking about and referencing history shows were Yamasi, because mm -hmm. we last were located in northern Florida, which is where my family's from. Prior to proceeding, I aim to thoroughly debunk and refute the narrative propagated by Pan-African advocates, the critics, the naysayers, the uneducated, unlearned, and unread regarding Indian slavery. To prove this, we are going to take a look at the book, Sketch of the Seminole War, and Sketches During a Campaign, by a lieutenant of the left wing, published 1836, page 21 through 22. In parts of Florida, there are still many Indian Negroes, or slaves of Indians, who live pretty much like free Negroes, in settlements by themselves, spending much of their time in hunting, they can scarcely be said to be slaves, having so much freedom, and they are indulgently treated by their masters. They are many of them runaways and refugees. In the late war with Great Britain, 400 of them were embodied in arms under one Carl Woodbine, who received and commissioned from one of the governors of the West India Islands, and the Indians themselves were kept in awe by them and found themselves in danger of being subjected to a dolocracy. It was to be feared that the dangerous example of the enticing independence enjoyed by these Negroes, their corrupting communication with the slaves of the planter, and their actual league with hostile Indians might exert an evil influence upon this property in Florida. But the event has shown that a large majority of our slaves preferred to remain with their masters in the happy and secure state of servitude to which they had been accustomed, rather than to seek a better one in a visionary and uncertain independence, an exemption from toil in which they would still be subject to dominion of another sort to the lawless caprices and cruel power of some savage tyrant, to cares and privations and numberless other ills. Now, let's explain the passage which discusses the situation of Indian Negroes or slaves of Indians in certain parts of Florida during that time. I am going to make a breakdown of the text. 
first, the Indian Negroes in Florida. The passage mentions that in parts of Florida, there were still Indian Negroes or slaves belonging to indigenous peoples, showing that these Indian were in fact of dark complexion or what some may refer to as black, in addition to also proving that these so-called Negro slaves were Indian, who lived somewhat like free Negroes. They resided in separate settlements and spent a significant portion of their time hunting. These individuals were said to have a level of freedom that was unusual for slaves during that era. Second, freedom of Indian Negroes. The text points out that these Indian Negroes could hardly be classified as typical slaves due to the amount of freedom they enjoyed. Their Indian masters treated them indulgently, meaning that these slaves were treated with a certain degree of kindness, leniency, or generosity by their Indian masters. They were not subjected to the harsh, oppressive treatment that was common for many enslaved people under the slavery of Europeans. The word indulgent implies that their masters were lenient in their approach to slavery, instead of being subjected to severe or cruel forms of servitude. These Indian Negroes were allowed freedoms, more autonomy in their daily lives, and were given privileges that were uncommon for most enslaved people in that era. This might include having more control over their own time, engaging in activities such as hunting, and having better living conditions and treatment compared to what was typical for slaves. Furthermore, on certain occasions, Indian Negro slaves were family members, tribal members, or individuals from other tribes. They were often kept in a state of slavery in order to protect them, primarily because they were prohibited from purchasing their freedom, and the buyers had to acquire these Indian slaves without awareness of their familial or tribal connections to these slaves. Third, refugees and runaways. Many of these Indian Negroes were described as runaways or refugees. In the context of the passage, this means that they had left their original masters and sought refuge with Indian communities. For it, Kyle Woodbine in the late war, during the conflict with Great Britain likely referring to the War of 1812, around 400 of these Indian Negroes were organized into an armed force under the leadership of Colonel Woodbine. He received a commission from one of the governors of the West Indies. The Indians, in turn, found themselves in a situation where they were at risk of being subjected to a dolocracy. Dolocracy is a less common term, and its meaning can vary depending on the context. In this context, it seems to refer to a form of governance or leadership structure characterized by shared or dual authority. The Indians were in danger of being subjected to such a system, meaning that they might have faced a situation where power and control were divided between different leaders, which could have implications for their own autonomy and decision-making. Fifth, potential influence. The text suggests that the independence enjoyed by these Indian Negroes was seen as a potentially dangerous example. Their interaction with Negro Indian slaves on plantations and their alliance with believed hostile Indian groups could have a negative impact on the institution of slavery in Florida causing possible uprisings. 6. Slave Loyalty Despite the allure of the independence these Indian Negroes offered, the passage notes that a significant majority of Negro Indian slaves in Florida chose to remain with their masters. They believed that they valued the relative safety and familiarity of their servitude over the uncertain prospect of independence, which could come with its own set of challenges and dangers such as being re-enslaved under the rule of a tyrannical European settler. Overall, this passage provides insights into the complex dynamics of slavery and freedom in Florida during the early 19th century, as well as the interactions between different groups of people in the region during a time of conflict. Continuing on, in the footnotes of page 21, where it is mentioned, Nicolopi possess upwards of a hundred Negro slaves, they do no work except to make him a little corn, and he is not apparently the richer for them than any other Indian, and is living in much the same style as the poorest among them. Some of these Negroes were purchased with cattle, of which the Seminoles possess vast herds, and very fine. One of their chiefs formerly used to sell annually 1,000 heads of steers. Now, let's explain this passage. It describes the situation of Mikonopi, an indigenous Seminole chief, and his ownership of a significant number of these Negro Indian slaves. Here are some key points. 1. Mikonopi slave ownership. Mikonopi is said to own more than 100 of these Negro Indian slaves. These slaves were used for a specific purpose, which is to cultivate some corn. This means that they were engaged in agricultural work, likely to provide sustenance for the community. 2. Limited economic gain. Despite the large number of slaves he possessed, Mikonopi doesn't seem to be significantly wealthier than other Seminole Indians. The passage suggests that the presence of these slaves did not result in an obvious increase in his wealth or prosperity. In other words, Mikonopi's wealth was not markedly higher than that of other Seminole Indians who did not own slaves. 
this additional evidence underscores that the primary purpose was to safeguard and preserve the well-being of these fellow American Indians. 3. Lifestyle similar to other Seminoles. Mikonopi is described as living a lifestyle that is quite similar to the poorest Seminoles. This implies that, despite his slave ownership, his living conditions and overall way of life were not markedly different from those of other members of his tribe. For slave acquisition, some of Mikonopi's slaves were acquired through barter, particularly with cattle. The Seminole Indians were known to possess large herds of cattle, and they had access to fine breeds. The passage also mentions that one of the Seminole chiefs used to sell a considerable number of cattle annually, specifically a thousand heads of steers. This suggests that cattle were used as a valuable commodity for trade, potentially in exchange for acquiring slaves. In summary, the passage highlights the unique dynamics of slave ownership among the Seminole Indians, with Mikonopi possessing a relatively large number of slaves who primarily worked in agriculture. However, their ownership did not necessarily lead to a significant increase in Mikonopi's wealth, and he lived in a manner similar to other members of his tribe. The acquisition of some of these slaves was facilitated through trade, particularly involving cattle. This serves as additional confirmation of my argument. If you would like to express your encouragement towards these works and content, please go to paypal.me slash sunoyi yt, or you can even directly contribute through Cash App at dollar sign sunoyi. Your encouragement. Leave a comment. Let me know what y'all think about the the wars. If you are already familiar with the wars, a lot of us have Creek, Seminole, Gullah, these tribes and us. These are the modern European tribes, but not named for the tribes, but we are all a part of the Yamasee Nation. Hit that like button. Leave a comment. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace and love, family.